I am Jeff, and I am second. I am Kendra. And I'm Ed. And we, and we are, are second. second. I am Harry, and I am second. I am Julie, and I am second. And my name is James, and I am second. I am Lane. I'm Laura, and, and we, we are, are second. second. My name is Brian, and I am second. I'm Julie, and I am second. I'm Jason. I'm Brianna. We, we are, are second. second. I'm Barbara, and I am second. I am Kiri, and I am second. Hey, my name is Heidi, and I am second. Hey, I'm Wallace, and I'm Wendy. And, and we, we are, are second. second. I'm Gretchen, and I am second. We are in our second week of this series called I Am Second. And if you're like, I feel like I've heard this before, you probably have because we borrowed the idea from somebody else. But that's what you do. Like if there's a really good idea out there, you grab it and you just make it your own. And so that's what we're doing. But if you're like, what on earth is I, I Am Second? Like it's just a statement. And nobody that I know of celebrates second place. Except for Detroit Lions fans. We unashamedly celebrate second place because that's about all we've ever been able to achieve. Man. We're, we are unashamedly in second place. That means we're headed in the right direction, man. But I'll tell you who else celebrates second place. People who have found life by making Jesus first in their lives. They celebrate being second because they know that that's where life is found. They're like, Jesus, it's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. And so that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about I am second before, we, or uh, I am second. But before we get there, I hope that you guys had as great of a time in your community group as we did in ours. We had an absolute blast. And if you missed last week's, I'm going to tell you, you need to go back and watch the story. These I am second stories of people just talking about the process of how they went from first to moving Christ into first. They became second. Well, there's a guy last week in community group. His name was Lee. And I think he pronounced his last name Yi. Lee Yi. What a story and painful at the beginning. But what I loved about him was he's just real. Like he wasn't trying to be like, okay, I'm going to be at church. I'm going to tell you everything was okay. He doesn't do that. I love it. He goes, let me tell you something. He goes, my life was awful. Like you wouldn't have wanted to live my life for five minutes because from a little kid, I didn't belong with anyone and I didn't belong anywhere. And as a teenager, I didn't belong with anyone or anywhere. And as a young 20 something, I fought for an area that had no place to fit in. And now here I am, a grown adult, a grown man. And I'm wondering, where do I fit in? I feel so lost. I feel so disconnected. I feel like I don't belong. And then somebody took the took a flyer on he and his wife and invite him over for dinner. And if you watch the video, you remember him saying this. He just goes, I'm just a sucker for love. And why wouldn't he be a sucker for love? Because if that's what he's been looking for his entire life, man, he just wants somebody to love him. And thank God that somebody put the right people in his path because, man, these people that invited him over were different than a lot of people. And, that, and Lee could see the difference. He said, tell me, man, why are you guys inviting me over for dinner? Like, what, what is your story? And they said, Lee... We love Jesus, and we know he loves you, and we enjoy being around you, so we wanted you to come over to our house. And then in his own words, they prayed. But they prayed in such a way that it wasn't like practiced, it wasn't rehearsed, it wasn't religious. In Lee's own words, he said, man, they prayed in a way that they talked to God like they, they actually knew him. They talked to God like there was this relationship there, and I love that. Because God isn't about religion. Jesus isn't about religion. He's about relationship. Like you can know him and you can go to him in the worst times of your life. But man, don't just settle for that. You get to celebrate with him during the best times of your life. And that's even better. And so Lee sees this and he goes home and he's like, I haven't fit in anywhere. And he, he wasn't sure like, how is God going to be as a dad? But he knew it was better than anything he had. And so he asked God to accept him. And sure enough, man, God accepted him because why? Because God gave his son Jesus to make a way for us to be in relationship with him. And thus started this beautiful story where Lee just said, my life changed when Jesus became first and I became second. And it just goes to reiterate the point of what we talked about last week. 
we're better together. Like Lee's story started in community all around this little dinner. We're better together. But we want to be better together in a way that helps people experience Jesus. Last week we talked about four friends had a paralytic friend and they took him to Jesus and they were better to get together in a way that everyone experienced Christ. Lee, they were battered together in a way that helped other people experience Jesus. Well, today we're going to take our next step, and I am second. And I'm going to stick with the whole better thing because I like it. And I'm going to talk about how God wants to write a better story with your life. Like God wants to write a better story with your life. God is in the business of writing better stories with our lives when he is first and we're second. He turns underdogs into front runners. He turns underdogs into fan favorites. He takes tragedies and he turns them into triumphal moments when he's first, when we're second, when he's writing the story and his stories are always better. In just a second, you're going to get to hear a story from a guy, and I love it, man. I fell in love with this. In fact, I fell in love with it so much, we were going to show you a different story today, and I said, no way, this is I am second. This is a story. This is what God wants to talk about. This is what Mike Fackler wants to talk about. This is awesome. It's just a better story. It's incredible. Like this guy, he's got these dreams. Hollywood has shaped his life from the time he was a young kid until one day it didn't and he let go of that type of control and he let God have control and then God started writing his story and he goes down all these broken roads and God weaves through every every stop on his journey and he just weaves this story together so the guy you're about to see he's always wanted to be an actor and Hollywood has shaped his life until one day Jesus began to shape his life check out his story and you'll see too it's just a better story when I was a kid, uh, my mom would take my brother and I to the movies. It was somewhat of a pastime for us to detach from our life and enter into this new world through film for two hours. <laughs> right in the center? When this movie by the name of Bad Boys came out, which was directed by Michael Bay. That was the first movie I remember seeing where there were two heroes who looked like me, and they weren't playing thugs or gangsters or drug dealers, but instead they were playing heroes who were essentially running, gunning, and saving the day. A year later, Michael Bay's second film, The Rock, came out, and that was the first time I was exposed to Navy SEALs. And I was just blown away by this portrayal of men who were coming out of the water and going into this uh, place to go sacrifice themselves to save others. That really resonated with me, and I thought, if I was to ever turn my life around, that's what I would do. That's just that's a, all yours now. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm gone. See what Ever since I was young, I always wanted to control things. When I would want something, I would literally, if I had to, if I had to, I would run through walls to get it. I've always felt like I needed to be the one to make things happen in my life. And it's hard for me to trust people or to trust something outside of me. Through culture and music, I was constantly bombarded with this message that said, you're a young African-American male. You need to be a hustler, or you need to be a thug, or you need to be a player. And because I didn't have a positive male role model to tell me otherwise, to say, no, this is not what a man is. This is what a man is. I started out stealing from my mom that progressed to running scams and that progressed to selling drugs. And when my father died, I took in any and everything that I felt would would satisfy that paternal void that would teach me how to be a man. One day I was laying in bed and this voice, whatever it was, it was a voice to me, but it was just, it just kept on pressing upon me that I needed to join the military. I needed to get out of New York and join the military was what I needed to do. There's not many jobs out there where you can get paid to 
you know, jump out of planes and go after bad guys and protect those who couldn't protect themselves. Essentially be that guy who stood in the face of bullies and, and said, not on my watch. My acting coach, he trained in Stella Adler. And Stella Adler was a proponent for actors getting out of their environment and traveling the world, seeing different cultures, tasting different foods, um, experiencing love, experiencing pain, experiencing all these experiences that life has to offer, and then taking those experiences and cataloging them um, so that actor is able to pull from those experiences to bring the character to life. I went to uh, cold weather survival training in Alaska. And while I would walk through this wilderness, I really had time to reflect upon myself in the silence because it was completely silent out there. I began to think about how I treated my mom and how I treated people I claimed I loved. And I would think about things that I did in the past and I still yearn for that paternal presence. I couldn't really sleep and then I began to have suicidal thoughts. I was at the lowest point I had ever been in my entire life. I didn't know anything about the Bible, but by a simple ounce of faith, I literally begin to cry out to Jesus. Literally begin to cry out to Jesus. Help me, Jesus, help me. Then I began to surround myself around Christians who didn't just read the Bible, but they actually lived the Bible. And I began to pray, and all I wanted to do was be with him and do for him and forsake that life I used to live and live this new life with him. My whole life was dramatically changed, you know. Just like I felt God tell me, you need to join the military, I felt God pressing upon me the importance of, it's time for you to get out of the military. It's time for you to move on. I have something else for you. I didn't know how I was gonna pay the bills. <laughs> I was expecting to have all these opportunities for speaking engagements, because I got into speaking and that didn't happen, <laughs> the phones didn't ring. I began to get really nervous because I knew that I had only about six months of savings. I have a wife and she's pregnant with our first son. We're just barely scraping through, like we're living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, I had financial problems and then to compound the financial problems, we had significant marriage problems and the marriage problems were so bad, we both contemplated getting a divorce. It just didn't work out the way I expected it. And when it didn't work out, I got so frustrated. There, were, there was a point where I got mad at God. I hear you wrong. Was I supposed to get out of the military? Was I supposed to make that decision? It was silence. <laughs> it was silence. Around that time, um, I received a phone call from um, a lady who I worked with for years prior. She, uh, she cast me in a TV show by the name of The Last Ship, you know, back in 2013 for, as, for a day of, of filming. And uh, she said, well, I've been trying to, you know, find you for this movie that starts filming tomorrow. And I was like, okay, what, what movie is that? She said, well, it's Transformers. Three, two, three, 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 four. I started out as a day player. Two weeks later, I was called back for three more weeks of filming. I started to get lines from the director, which was unusual for me, because I was like, wow, I'm just, just a you know, background extra. They said to me, hey, the director wants to upgrade you to a principal role. Are you available to film for the rest of production? And I said, absolutely. The director happened to be Michael Bay. <laughs> the same one who inspired me to be a SEAL. If you know, when you look at my story going from the Bronx to the military and to special operations, out of that, in a marriage, having, being a husband, being a father, and then now having a career in acting in, in the film industry, there's one word I could sum it up with is God. And so he's been with me throughout my entire life. 
he's seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And he's used it all to bring me to where I'm at today. I don't want to force things anymore. I just want to allow God to do whatever it is that he wants to do in my life. If he wants to take me out of this acting career next week, then so be it. If he wants me to get back into the military, so be it. If he wants me to go into ministry full-time, so be it. If he wants me to take up a job, I don't know, as a pilot or whatever, <laughs> so be it. Uh, because I know that his plan is better than any plan that I could ever have. And even though his plan may not make sense to me, within his plans is everything that I need and everything that is not just good for me, but good for my family as well. That's a guy letting God write a better story. And how much better is it? Dude, he got to play in Transformers. <laughs> can you imagine that? I can. That would be awesome. Yeah, that's incredible. Oh, my goodness. Listen, I'm just going to be honest with you, and I'm going to gush over this thing for a few minutes. And by gushing on it, I'm gushing on God because God just writes a better story. And maybe as you just even think about that and you consider your own life and how God's been writing a better story, or maybe this morning God is inviting you to let him write a better story with your life. But one of the parts that I absolutely love about that is here's this guy who's far from God and he doesn't know how to articulate it, but he feels pressed upon to join the military and God's just starting to write his story and he doesn't even know it yet. And the beautiful part is, is I don't know where you're, with, where you're at with God today. Maybe you're close to him. Maybe you're letting him write a story. Maybe you're far from him. I don't know. But what you need to see is even when we're far from God, he loves us so much that he doesn't just leave us alone. He comes after us. He wants what's best for us. He loves us so much he gave his own son, and he went after Remy. It's awesome. And what I love is, is, uh, is just um, Remy's willingness to be, again, transparent, because I think we can really relate to him on this level. He was a control freak. And I think each and every one of us on some level or in some area of our life or unfortunately with someone, maybe we're just control freak. Like maybe we're trying to control some things. God can't write a better story unless he has control. And I'm just wondering if there's an area of your life, and maybe it's not an area, maybe it's a person, like where you need to give up control so that he can write a better story with you. And maybe it's area, substance, relationship, God wants to write a better story because here's the beauty. If you just look through history, and this was so much fun studying and processing thinking this week, of just how God writes better stories. Now, this hasn't worked good for me in any service, but I'm going to go for it one more time. If you grew up in church and you know who Moses is, just raise your hand. Oh, you guys nailed it. Nailed it. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, man, you, um, Moses Dude, tell me God didn't write a better story with Moses. Like, here's this baby growing up in Egypt as a slave. And then Pharaoh freaks out. The ruler of Egypt freaks out because there's too many Hebrew people. So he orders a mass genocide. A genocide that was supposed to take Moses' life out. But miraculously, because God has a better story for him, watches over his life. And Moses ends up growing up in the very palace of the one who wanted him dead as an infant. And he goes through all this Egyptian education. He's getting smarter. He's growing up. And he sees his people who are enslaved. And he knows there's a little difference between them and him. And he sees these Egyptian slave masters beating on his people. And just this really brash moment, Moses steps out. And he just says, enough is enough. And he, all he wants to do is break up the fight. But he ends up delivering a mortal blow, kills the Egyptian slave master and he freaks out because he's like oh my goodness I'm dead so he under the cover of darkness flees and the next 40 years he spent wandering around wandering around in the desert man if you're Moses you're sitting there thinking to yourself I grew up in a palace and now I'm out here with sheep in the desert 
And you're probably thinking, if you're Moses, God is done with me. Like, this is the best I can ever hope for. And God meets him out in the wilderness. And he says, Moses, I'm going to walk you through every fear you have because I'm sending you back into Egypt, not for your sake, but for my people's sake. Because I have a future for them. I have identity for them. And they're going to be my people. And I'm going to be their God. And they're going to be my picture to the world of how much I love people. So Moses, you got to go back there. And Moses gets to go back there. And he gets a front row seat to all all these miracles and he gets to see God do what only he can do and you would have to agree God wrote a better story when Moses just said God I'll let you write I'll follow you lead I'll follow you're in control I'm not God just writes a better story you think about the disciple Peter he was a fisherman now I'm not knocking that job because I think that that's a sweet job If you can make a living fishing every day, good on you. That is cool, man. But God had something even cooler. And he says, hey, I want you, you're going to be a disciple of my son Jesus, the the Savior of the world, the Son of God. And Peter begins to follow Jesus for three years, and he's all in. He's left everything behind. He's like, man, Jesus, you're the man, you're the Son of God, I'm all in. And then one night the pressure ramps up, and the stress really piles on, and Jesus Christ is arrested. And that night Jesus had told him, he goes, Peter, you're going to deny me. And Peter's like, there's no way I'm going to ever deny you. Jesus is like, okay, we'll see. A few hours later, Jesus is standing trial, and Peter's out in the courtyard. And they're like, hey, were you with him? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know that, man. A little while later, somebody comes up. Hey, you look like, I think I've seen you with Jesus before. No, you haven't. Your eyes are going bad. I don't even know who that is. A little while later, hey, I'm pretty sure I've seen you with Jesus. You're one of his followers, aren't you? You must be outside your mind. You're crazy. I'm not with that criminal. He denied Jesus three times. I bet in that moment, I bet in that moment, Peter thought to himself, God's done with me. I bet he thought God's done with me. I just denied his son in front of all these people. But you see, God's not done. The story's not over. His life's not over. God always writes better stories. And Peter repents and Jesus reinstates. And Peter goes on to do miracles that would, if you would have told him back when he was a fisherman, it would have blown his ever-loving mind. He said, get me there right now. And Jesus said, no, we got a story to write first. God writes a better story, but guess what? He's got to be first and we got to be second. And this one's way too good not to mention. Who was Jesus next to when he was dying on the cross for you and me? Who was he next to? He was next to criminals. Criminals. And God's love couldn't be stopped there either. People are hurling insults up at the Son of God. They're hurling insults at him. The criminal on this one side is joining in and mocking Christ with the rest of them. And the guy on the other side, the criminal, the thief on the other side, says, wait a minute. You and me, we deserve what we're getting. We've been some bad dudes. But this guy's never done anything wrong. And he looks at Jesus, and in my words, not his, he says, I believe you're the son of God. I'm dying right now, but in my last few minutes, You're first. You can save my life. And Jesus says, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. You see, that guy was at the end of the story. But it ain't over until God says it's over. And he's not done writing until he says he's done writing. And even in the last and final minutes, there is still a way Because Jesus says there's a way. Because he's made a way. And the thing I love about God writing better stories is if you listen and look at the people that we've talked about over the last few minutes, we call them heroes. They're flawed heroes. Can I tell you something? And I'm not saying I'm a hero. Here's what I'm saying. 
I'm flawed. And if God can use those guys, he can use us too. He can write a better story with our life, but he's got to be first. And we've got to be second. And that gets down to a control issue. Who's in control of your life? Like, are you trying to control it or are you letting him control it? We've just got a few minutes left. And in the few minutes that we have remaining, what I want to do is I want to give you three things that you can do. These are things that you already know. And sometimes it's just great to get a refresher. But I'm going to give you three things that you already know that will help you step into a better story, like the story that God has for your life. And the first one is simple. Trust in the Lord. comes from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord. If you want to live a better story, if you want to live God's story for your life, then he's got to be first, you've got to be second, and you've got to trust in him. Now I hear people say all the time, Mike, I believe in Jesus, I believe in God. Awesome. Trusting is belief in action. Trusting in the Lord is faith in action. It is a response to your belief. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all that you have. If you want to live a better story, start trusting in the Lord. Trust him. His faith in action. Lean not on your own understanding. That's where it gets hard. Because I don't know how you're wired, but man, when I look around, I can see the mountains in my way. I can see the hardships in my life. And what happens when I see mountains and what happens when I see, see hardships? That's what I pay attention to. And I say things like, this sucks. And I say things like, I don't want this in my life. I say things like, this is hard. Like, I don't want to do this. And I get anxiety and I get stressed. Let's just be honest, I freak out. Maybe you do too. And I'm fixated there. But when we're locked down there, when we see a mountain, God sees an object that can be moved. Like when we see a mountain or a hardship in our life, God says, I know they think they can't climb it. But if they would trust in me, they're going to see a better story because I'm going to lead them up that mountain. And I'm going to lead them over it. And when they get there, they're going to celebrate me. But it takes trusting in the Lord and leaning not on our own understanding. And if whatever it is you're facing today has got you freaked out, It's got you fearful, got you stressed out. I think God looks at those emotions in his kids' lives and he says, ah, it's just a runway. Eventually they're gonna work their way through it and I'm gonna show them that with me they can be a mighty warrior. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna show them that if they'll trust in me and that I'm faithful to them, we're gonna give them an unshakable faith. You wanna live a better story? Don't just believe in God. Start there, but trust in him. Part of trusting in him is casting all your cares on him. 1 Peter 5 and 7. I love what Peter said. Peter should know. You get to cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Cast all your cares. I love that. I'm a feeler. If there's a feeler in here, you're neurotic just like I am. Because when it says all your cares, you should be jacked up about that. All of them. The good ones, the bad ones, the logical ones, the irrational ones, the ones that you're just crazy. We get to cast like all of that on Jesus. Why? Because he actually cares about us. He cares for us. And listen, you smart people who have never had a feeling in your life, you're neurotic too, man. So let's just be honest about that because you're thinking, oh, I'm too smart. I got to figure it out. No, you don't. All right. We're all neurotic together. <laughs> we all need Jesus. And we all have a place to cast our cares on him because he cares for us. I was just got back from elk hunting this week. Man, it was awesome. But I'll tell you what wasn't awesome. is The hardest part about elk hunting is you have to go up and down mountains. And you have to go up and down mountains with a really heavy backpack on. A very heavy backpack. And I remember going up and down these mountains thinking, this backpack is getting heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. And then we would hear an elk bugle, and that was awesome. So what would I do? I would take my pack and I would cast it off. It's like I'm not carrying this anymore. I'm going after something better. It's a really lame illustration. 
but it does drive home the point. Casting your cares on him, like it's lame in the fact that it doesn't even, like it doesn't even begin to drill down to how hard it is to carry emotional baggage. I know some of you guys walked in here with the weight of the world on your shoulders, man. Like there's some emotional stuff. It could be a broken relationship. It could be a job. It could be, it could be a number of things. You walked in here emotionally and you just feel the weight of the world on your shoulders. And this morning I'm telling you, you can trust in God. And this morning, like right now, even as I talk, you get the opportunity to like cast all your cares on him. And he'll pick them up and he'll take them for you. Why? Because he cares for you. And you get the sense of relief. And you get to live in a better story. And you get to thank God for his son Jesus who loves you so much that he would carry that garbage for you. That he carry it for me. And maybe it's not an emotional deal. Maybe you walked in and it's a physical thing for you. Like or a physical thing for somebody that you love. And it's just weighing down. Weighing you down. Weighing people down. You're just blue. You get to cast it off. Trust in him. Cast all your cares on him. Because he cares for you. And when you do that, you get to just step into this better story. And part of your better story is that you actually had that garbage in the first place. And you saw that garbage. And that God loved you so much, he took it away from you. Like he carried it. I'm going to close by giving you a prayer to pray. It's a powerful prayer. You've heard this prayer if you've gone to church at any point in your life. It's a prayer that Jesus Christ prayed himself. It's a powerful prayer. It's literally minutes before Jesus is going to be arrested. And he knows for some time that God has been writing a better story. It's why he came. He knew that God was writing a better story. But he knew he was going to be arrested. And he knew that he was going to be crucified. And those things didn't really freak him out. I'll tell you, probably what freaked him out was the fact that he knew that your sin and my sin and everybody, all humanity's sin for all time was going to be rested on his shoulders. And God hates sin. And he knew that God was going to pour out his full entire last ounce of wrath upon Jesus and he begins to just stress and there's anxiety and it's not pretty moments before he's arrested but he knows that God's writing a better story for you and me and he knows he's a part of it and he knows that the lamb has got to be slain so that the lion could roar and he says God if there's any way this cup could pass from me and then he says the prayer. But God, it's not about me. It's about you. You're first. I'm second. Not my will, but your will be done. That is a life-changing prayer. That is a precursor to a better story. Not my will, God but your will be done. That is a prayer that we shouldn't start every day with. That is a prayer we should pray continually throughout the day with, where you lead every circumstance, God, not my will, but your will be done. That prayer is the precursor to a better story, not an easier story. In fact, I guarantee you, it'll get harder. That is not the pathway to an easy story. We all want an easy story. No, we all want a better story. That's how you get it. Say, God, not my will, but your will be done. You see, that prayer right there turns underdogs into front runners. That prayer right there turns underdogs into fan favorites. That prayer right there turns tragedies into triumphs. That prayer right there creates a better story. And that prayer right there makes God first and we are second. I want to pray that prayer. I want to live that better story. That's how you do it. Trust in the Lord. Cast all your cares on him. Remember Remy? Even when it wasn't pretty, he just said, God, even when it doesn't make sense, I'll follow you. Because you're first and I'm second. Not my will, but your will be done. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we've come together as a church today. We've come here in a wild, relentless pursuit of you. And you have shown up. And your spirit has filled us up. And I pray as we walk outside of these doors that we would trust in you no matter what comes our way. 
that we would rest in you, that we would call out to you, that we would cast our cares on you, and we just say, God, whatever it is you have for us, not my will, not our will, but your will be done for your name and for your glory and so that the world, will, so that the world may know your saving grace. In Jesus' name, amen.